an unshakable kingdom. The letter to the Hebrews for today. Written by David Gooding. Read by Andy Mayo. The study guides for each chapter have not been included in this recording. You can access them in the PDF that accompanies this audiobook or visit our website www.myrtlefieldhouse.com and search for an unshakable kingdom study guide. Chapter 1 The Hebrews the letter to the Hebrews is ablaze with the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory of his deity, his manhood, his priesthood and sacrifice, his triumphant life of faith, his resurrection and ascension, and the certainty of his coming again. At the same time, it contains dark and somber warnings which are longer and more solemn than any we find in the other letters of the New Testament. Because of these warnings, many Christians have found Hebrews a difficult letter to understand. Some have even found it frightening. How then shall we proceed? In the first of these studies, we shall examine the letter generally to discover to whom it was written and for what reasons and in what circumstances. As we first of all understand what bearing Hebrews had on the circumstances and lives of the people to whom it was originally written, we shall appreciate more fully and more accurately its bearing on our own situation. The Readers The title that we find in the manuscripts to the Hebrews is obviously an appropriate title. The letter contains many things that would appeal to Hebrews even more than to us Gentiles. It is full of references to the Jewish priesthood, to the tabernacle, to its services and to its sacrifices. It has frequent references to Israel's history and to the worthies of the Old Testament. Hebrews was obviously not written to former pagans who had now come to faith in Christ. It was written rather to Jews brought up in the Jewish faith who had in addition professed faith in Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. Where did they live? Many people have thought Jerusalem, others think Caesarea or Rome or Antioch. We cannot know for certain. This much is obvious. They still had a tremendous regard for the temple at Jerusalem, its priesthood, sacrifices and rituals. This would have been natural if they lived in Jerusalem and constantly visited the temple and took part in its services. But there is evidence enough from the ancient world that even Jews who lived in distant cities of the diaspora and who never visited the temple, or only rarely on some pilgrimage of a lifetime, could nevertheless feel great devotion to the temple and loyalty to the authority of the high priest. And it seems clear that the readers of this letter did so, for what would have been the point of talking at great length about the tabernacle priesthood and sacrifices to Jews who no longer had any interest in or attachment to these things? The date. As to the date of the letter, we shall find hints here and there in the letter itself. For instance, in chapter 13, verse 7, we find an exhortation to remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Apparently, there had been time from the moment when the gospel was first preached for people to have been converted, for groups of Christians to have been formed, and for the senior Christians, who at the beginning had carried responsibility in these groups, to have died. On the other hand, at the end of chapter 8, we find more than a suggestion that the letter was written before AD 70. By calling this covenant new, says the writer, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. 
He does not say that the old covenant and all connected with it has disappeared. He says that there is already a new covenant based on better promises than the old. The old covenant had the tabernacle and the priesthood and the sacrifices. The new covenant has another system of worship. And the very fact that there is a new covenant, says the writer, proves that the first one is old. Then he adds, what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. It has not yet disappeared, but it soon will. These facts put together tell us roughly just about when the letter was written. It was not yet AD 70, but it was getting very near to the time when, as you will remember, the Roman armies took Jerusalem and fulfilled the prophecy of the Lord Jesus that not one stone of the temple would be left standing upon another. Luke chapter 21 verse 6. It was that very short, critical period when the old system was approaching its end. The new system was already there, but only in its infant days. Gradually, it was gaining strength, and a time of crisis for both Judaism and Christianity was fast approaching. The Reader's Spiritual State We can come closer to the readers if we look again at chapter 10, verses 32 to 34. They had made a confession of faith in the Lord Jesus, and upon that confession they had been severely persecuted. Sometimes they were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times they stood side by side with those who were so treated. They sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of their own property. Even at this distance in history we can still admire their courage and the firmness of their testimony to the Lord Jesus. But the letter also reveals that things were not so well with them now as they had been. The writer indicates in chapter 10 verse 25 that some were giving up meeting together as Christians. Perhaps if you had gone and asked them why they were not there, some of them might have turned around and said, Oh, we can still believe in Christ at home. But, you know, it was a very suspicious symptom. Why were they now staying away? What did it imply about their faith? It is clear, at any rate, that the writer of this letter saw in this one symptom alone a very grave possibility. His letter is full of exhortations that they should hold fast the profession of their faith. See, for example, chapter 4, verse 14. Not merely their keenness, not merely their form of godliness, but the profession of their faith. Obviously, the writer feared that some of these people who had stood so boldly at the beginning might now abandon their profession of faith in Jesus as Messiah completely. His fears, we gather, were reinforced by the memory of what had happened centuries before to their ancestors in the desert. The Israelites had made a bold start, left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea, crying triumphantly, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. Exodus chapter 15 verse 1. But later on, when they got to the borders of Canaan, the great majority of them had refused point blank to go any further and enter the promised land. Haunted by this memory, our author warns his readers most seriously. He's afraid, he says, that some of them might be beginning to show the same pattern of behavior as their ancestors. Chapter 4, verse 1. Later, in his sixth chapter, he thinks it prudent to issue another similar warning. He describes in detail the serious consequences when people who have once been enlightened fall away. It is impossible, he says, to bring them again to repentance. And without repentance there can of course be no forgiveness or salvation either. Later still, in his tenth chapter, 
he reminds his readers that if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. Chapter 10, verse 26. Obviously, there were symptoms in the behavior of these early Hebrew converts that caused the writer grave concern. Their history. In subsequent studies, we shall attempt not only to understand what was said to them, but also to apply it to ourselves, where and however it fits. We must therefore, and I wish to emphasize this heavily, patiently try to understand what their situation really involved. Think again. Here were people brought up in the traditional Jewish faith. For centuries, their nation's ideas of God had been bound up with the splendid temple at Jerusalem with the chanting of the Levites and of the priests, with the wonderful ceremony and the delightful pageantry of those ancient services. There was incense to smell and music to listen to, the high priest in his spectacularly beautiful robes, the ordinary priests washing at the laver, worshippers confessing their sins, holy sacrifices being offered, and an atmosphere of awe and devotion. Our Hebrews, then, had been brought up in a religion honoured by the names of all their great ancestors, patriarchs, kings and prophets. Moses had worshipped in a tabernacle built according to the plans given him by God himself. Solomon likewise had built his magnificent temple according to plans God had supplied to his father David. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 verse 19 and their present temple was basically an enlarged and enriched copy of these earlier sanctuaries. They, like most Jews, loved their temple with passionate fervor. Two hundred years earlier, their ancestors in Palestine had endured bitter persecution when the Greek emperor Antiochus Epiphanes had turned their then existing temple into a pagan shrine complete with an idolatrous image of a Gentile deity. His banning of the worship of the one true God and the law of God on which that worship was based had sent violent shockwaves through the whole diaspora. But the Jews in Palestine had refused to give in to Antiochus's blasphemies, and many of them had paid with their lives for their faith in the system of worship laid down by God in the Old Testament. Experiences like that had understandably driven devotion to the temple deep into the heart of the nation. But then Jesus had come and claimed to be Israel's Messiah, to be the Son of God. The nation, as we know, had officially rejected that claim and had crucified him. But on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit had come poured out by the exalted Jesus, Acts chapter 2, verses 33 to 35. Mighty evidence that God had reversed the nation's decision and had made him both Lord and Christ, together with a succession of outstanding miracles performed in the name of Jesus, it had struck conviction into the hearts of some thousands of Jews. They had murdered the Messiah in ignorance, Acts chapter 3 verse 17, now they were glad to be allowed to repent, and in the very same city where their Messiah was crucified, they had been baptized in the name of Jesus, had been forgiven, and had received the Holy Spirit. A nation divided. Some of the older men and women among those to whom this letter was written may even have stood as residents or visitors in Jerusalem's streets when these mighty deeds were done. But for the most part, that generation had passed on. The majority were younger and had had the gospel confirmed to them by those who had heard the Lord Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 3. The nation's official leaders, of course, along with the majority of the nation everywhere, whichever one of the many Jewish sects they belonged to, still adhered to their decision that Jesus was not the Messiah. 
On the other hand, right from the start, there was a significant and constantly growing body of Jews, including many priests, Acts chapter 6 verse 7, who asserted that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, and that he was wrongly crucified. Now, normally, the non-Christian Jews would meet in their different synagogues, for in the Jewish nation, there were different synagogues with different traditions and different views. See Acts chapter 6 verse 9. The Christian Jews would normally meet in homes. See Acts chapter 2 verse 46. Or in their own synagogues. See James chapter 2 verse 2. NIV's meeting for Greek, synagogue. But Christian, as well as non-Christian, would go up to the temple from time to time and worship God there. In the Acts of the Apostles, you'll remember, we find men like Peter and John in the early years of Christianity attending the temple. And much later, we hear of Paul on returning from one of his missionary journeys visiting the temple. It was a natural centre both for Palestinian Jews and for Jews of the dispersion. Of course, the Christian Jews continued their witness to the Lord Jesus. The Old Testament, they pointed out, prophesied that the Messiah would suffer and then rise again from the dead. Jesus' death, therefore, far from proving that he was not the Messiah, proved that he was. God, they proclaimed, had also appointed him judge. The day was already set when God would judge the world with justice by this same Jesus. Acts chapter 2 verse 36, chapter 10 verse 42, chapter 17 verse 31. True, they realized that he must remain in heaven until the time came for God to restore everything as he had promised long ago through his holy prophets. Acts chapter 3 verse 21. But they did not think that that time was necessarily a long way off. Israel had only to repent and God would send the Messiah whom God had appointed for them. Acts chapter 3 verse 20. And then the Messiah would restore the kingdom to Israel, deliver them from the Romans and from all other Gentile imperialist oppressors and make Israel the head of the nations. Indeed, on the last occasion that the apostles had met the risen Lord before his ascension, they inquired if he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel there and then. Acts chapter 1 verse 6. Not there and then, he had replied. First, they must spread their witness to him throughout all nations. But by the time the letter to the Hebrews was being written, apostles such as Peter, not without the same initial reluctance, and Paul and crowds of Christian emigrants and expatriates had obeyed the Lord and spread the gospel far and wide among the Gentiles. Not unreasonably then, the Hebrew Christians expected the Lord to return soon. Adapting a phrase from an Old Testament prophet, they encouraged one another in the hope that, in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 37. He would come, so they expected, and set up his kingdom in Jerusalem, in Palestine, and throughout the whole world. And of course, that would finally prove to their fellow Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But the years went by and he did not come. The older Christians began to pass away, still he did not come. As the new faith grew and spread, the attitude of official Judaism, far from softening or showing signs of conversion or even of compromise, was in fact growing more intensely hostile. All round the Roman world, where new Christian groups were formed, the leaders of the local Jewish communities took every opportunity of turning the political authorities against the new sect. Riots were not uncommon. See Acts chapter 14 verses 4 to 6 and verse 19. Chapter 17 verses 5 to 8 and verse 13. 
chapter 18, verses 12 to 17. And then there was another thing that troubled some of the Hebrew Christians. As a result of the preaching of apostles such as Peter and Paul, Gentiles all round the Roman Empire were coming to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. But the apostles were making no attempt to get them to practice Jewish rituals and ceremonies. Indeed, they discouraged some and altogether forbade others. Gentile believers were not required to be circumcised, did not observe the traditions of the scribes or the rabbinical rules, sent no tribute to the temple at Jerusalem. What did it all mean? What were things coming to? Either or. When things had been going well and many of their fellow Jews were getting converted, the Hebrew Christians had been strong and courageous. But now, when their hopes for the conversion of Israel and the return of Christ seemed to be delayed and deferred and persecution was rising and opposition hardening, it's understandable that some of them had doubts. What if their hopes were not true? What if they had made a ghastly mistake and Jesus was not the true Messiah after all? On top of all that, they were soon to face an unavoidable crisis. As the nation as a whole hardened in its unbelief, the apostles were beginning to withdraw the Christian Jews from their Jewish synagogues. See Acts chapter 19 verse 9 and to shake off the dust of their feet against their fellow countrymen, explaining as they did so, We had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it, and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. It was becoming evident that Christianity could no longer be a part of Judaism. Soon they must part completely. Judaism must go its way. Christianity must take another road. We can scarcely understand what it meant for people who had been brought up in Judaism, to whom it was dearer than life itself, to be forced to a decision either to keep with it or to leave it. They would gladly have owned Jesus as Messiah if they could have had their temple and their high priest as well. But did it mean that it was an either-or? Either Jesus or the temple? Was it in fact either his sacrifice or Israel's animal sacrifices, but not both? Was it either Jewish politics and a Jewish homeland with a capital Jerusalem on earth, or a coming outside of that gate and outside of that camp completely? See Hebrews chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. To a Jesus who was rejected and likely to stay rejected by the nation. Was it an either or? Yes, it was. These people were soon to face the greatest crisis in all their spiritual experience. They deserve our deepest sympathy. Faced with problems like that, some of them were wavering. Some had stopped meeting with the believers. And I think we can now see what was going on in their minds. We can understand, too, what must have been going through the mind and heart of the person who wrote this letter. He cared for them and saw the grave crisis before them more clearly than they did. The all-important question was, which way would they go? Go back? What would be involved if they went back? Very carefully, the Spirit of God spells it out in chapter 10, verse 29. Let us read his words and let us make sure, to begin with, that we notice exactly what he says. Here is a literal translation of the verse. Of how much more severe a punishment shall he be considered worthy who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has considered the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified common and has insulted the Spirit of grace. Three things, therefore, would be involved 
if any of the Hebrews who had professed to accept Jesus as Messiah were to go back deliberately to the fold of Judaism and remain in it. First, they would trample underfoot the Son of God. Notice the verb trample underfoot. It describes a deliberate and perhaps also a spiteful action. Our Lord himself once spoke of some who fall over God's appointed foundation stone, that is to say himself. And the Apostle Paul declares that many Jews have stumbled over the stumbling stone. See Luke chapter 20 verse 18 and Romans chapter 9 verse 32. But trampling something underfoot and stamping on it is a far more deliberate action than simply tripping over or stumbling over or falling over something. The people envisaged in our verse have not simply been stumbled by the sheer size of the claims of Jesus. Deliberately and with determination they have trampled him underfoot. And notice exactly who it is that they are said to trample underfoot. Not Jesus, though of course it is he. But that is not the name which the Holy Spirit uses here, nor the Saviour, nor the Messiah, but the Son of God. They trample underfoot the Son of God, says Scripture. That is, they deliberately and with determination deny the deity of the Lord Jesus. Of course they do. From the very start, this was the fundamental issue at stake between Judaism and Christianity. Was Jesus, or was he not, the Son of God? The nation said, no, he was not. But the Hebrews, to whom our letter was written, had professed to believe that he was. Now, however, they were in danger of going back to their Judaism. What did it mean? They could not go back there unless once more they were prepared to say deliberately that Jesus was not the Son of God. Judaism would demand it of them. Originally, of course, in their pre-conversion ignorance, they had joined with the nation in denying his deity. Since then, however, they had been enlightened by the Holy Spirit. They could no longer claim ignorance. To return to Judaism now would mean deliberately and willfully and with their eyes open denying the deity of Jesus in spite of all the Holy Spirit's illumination. The next step would follow logically. They would adopt the considered opinion that the blood of Jesus was an unholy or, as the Greek has it, a common thing. Of course they would it would be automatic and inevitable. If Jesus is the Son of God, his blood is of infinite value. If he is not the Son of God, then his blood has no more worth than anyone else's blood. It is common blood. Notice, moreover, that it is described here as the blood of the new covenant. The value of the covenant depends altogether on the blood that signs and seals it. If the blood is valuable, then the covenant is valid. But if the blood is common, the covenant is not worth the paper that it's written on. To go back to Judaism then involved first that one denied the deity of Jesus. Secondly, and logically, one said his blood was common and held that the new covenant was worthless. And thirdly, to do this, says Scripture, was to insult the Spirit of grace. Notice again how he is described. It is the Holy Spirit, of course, but here he is referred to not as the Spirit of truth or the Spirit of holiness, but as the Spirit of grace. You see, the Jewish nation had crucified Jesus in their ignorance. How gracious it was of God not to wipe them out immediately but after the resurrection and ascension to give them the opportunity to repent. That was grace indeed. But to that grace, God added a superabounding grace. 
the Spirit of God who came down from heaven on the day of Pentecost told the people of Jerusalem, Look, you murdered God's Son, but you did it in ignorance. See Acts chapter 3 verse 17. Not only is God prepared to forgive you, but whereas formerly you tried to save yourselves by trying to keep God's law, now God is prepared to save you freely and for nothing, by grace without your works. What a magnificent message of mercy and grace it was. Not only the opportunity to repent, but a salvation utterly by grace and altogether as a gift. For anyone now, to go back to Judaism meant turning round to God and saying, God, I do not want grace, mercy and forgiveness for crucifying Jesus, but we do not want forgiveness for that. We would do it again if it were necessary. We do not believe he is your son. To go back to Judaism was to turn to God and say, Salvation is a gift? Nonsense. We're prepared to work our way to heaven by keeping the law, observing its rituals, and taking part in its sacrifices and ceremonies. And to say that was to offer terrible insult to the Spirit of grace. Genuine believers? Now, as we have already noticed, some of the people to whom the letter was written had developed the habit of staying away from the meetings of the Christians. If that meant they were going back to Judaism, and if going back to Judaism meant denying the deity of Jesus, considering his blood common and insulting the spirit of grace, how should we regard them? Were they true and genuine believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? At first sight, the answer might seem obvious. You can't deliberately and knowingly deny the deity of the Lord Jesus, deny the atoning value of his blood, and still be a genuine Christian, a true believer in the Lord Jesus. But we mustn't be hasty in our judgment. The great apostle Peter himself at one stage, overcome by panic, denied the Lord Jesus and used all the oaths and curses he knew to convince the bystanders that he was not a Christian. But he was, of course. Outwardly, he denied the Lord, but in his heart he remained a believer, as we know from our Lord's statements and from what subsequently happened. See Luke chapter 22, verses 31 to 32. His faith did not fail, and he came back to the Lord. Could it not be that some of these Hebrews, under pressure of persecution, were temporarily behaving inconsistently, as Peter did, outwardly going back to Judaism, though at heart still believers? On the other hand, if Peter had carried on for the next ten or twenty years, denying the Lord, avoiding the company of Christians, and taking his place fully in official Judaism, how could you have continued thinking he was a believer? After all, if someone himself consistently says he is not a believer and demonstrates that he is not by deliberately denying all the fundamentals of the Christian faith and shows no sign of remorse or of coming back to their saviour, what's the use of our trying to say that he is a believer? But then, if that is what some of these Hebrews were doing, or were in danger of doing, it raises another question. Were they ever true and genuine believers in the first place? Many people feel that they must have been, but that is not necessarily so at all. Consider a, a parallel case. The Apostle John in his first letter, 1 John chapter 2 verses 18 to 19, refers to people who not only for some time professed to be believers and were members of a Christian church, but even, it appears, had played the role of teachers in it. Eventually, however, they abandoned the fundamental apostolic doctrines, denied that Jesus was the Christ, 
and left the church. John's comment is that, in spite of earlier appearances, they never had been true believers at all. If they had belonged to us, he says, they would have remained with us. Their departure from the church and from the apostles' fellowship revealed, according to John, that none of them had ever belonged to us, that is, been genuine believers. Some argue, of course, that these Hebrews must have been believers at one time because the writer says explicitly, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29, that they had been sanctified by the blood of the covenant even though now they were in danger of denying Christ. And you can't be sanctified, they assume, without being a genuine believer. But again, this assumption is not necessarily correct. Scripture itself indicates that there are senses in which you can be sanctified without being a believer. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 14 says that the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Notice how impossible it would be to substitute the word justified for sanctified in this statement, for no one can be justified without faith. But obviously, there are senses in which people can be sanctified without being genuine believers. Let's look again at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. It speaks of our Hebrews having been sanctified by the blood of the covenant. It will help us understand this phrase if we remember that their ancestors in the desert had similarly been sanctified by the blood of the old covenant. Moses, we are told, took the blood of the calves and the goats and sprinkled both the book itself, that is the book containing the terms of the covenant, and the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has enjoined on you. See Exodus chapter 24 verses 5 to 8 and Hebrews chapter 9 verses 18 to 20. So they were sanctified by the blood of the covenant. But in spite of that, most of them later refused to enter the promised land. And what did that show? It showed, says our writer, who recalls this incident in great detail, that they did not believe the gospel. They never had believed. See chapter 4 verse 2 and Numbers chapter 14 verses 11 and verse 22. Similarly then, these Hebrews had professed to believe in the Lord Jesus and to accept the new covenant and they had taken their stand with the Christians and had separated themselves from the murderers of the Messiah, see Acts chapter 2 verse 40. They had been sanctified by the blood of the new covenant, but as with their ancestors, so with them. That still leaves open the question whether they had ever genuinely believed the gospel. And it was precisely this that their behavior was beginning to put in doubt. We should observe how carefully the writer chooses his words when he recalls their initial experience of Christianity. At Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4, he talks of those who have once been enlightened, not saved, mark you, but enlightened. At chapter 10 verse 32 again he says, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, not after you were saved or after you believed, but after you received the light. So once more at chapter 10 verse 26, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, not after we have believed the truth or have received the love of the truth, but simply have received the knowledge of the truth. And it is all too possible to know the truth without believing it. Granted, yet many people still feel that other phrases which the writer uses elsewhere imply quite clearly that his readers were or at one time had been true believers. He may not use the actual word saved, but he uses other equivalent terms which imply the same thing. Well, later on we shall investigate these terms in detail, but for the moment let us notice that the writer himself 
tells us explicitly how he assessed the spiritual history and state of the people to whom he was writing. We had better let him speak for himself. After describing the sad fate of those who, after being enlightened, go back to Judaism, he remarks, Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. Chapter 6, verse 9. That makes his position very clear. He is speaking as if they were not saved, although in actual fact, in his heart of hearts, he feels sure they are. He thinks indeed that he can see evidence in their lives that they are saved. Things, as he puts it, that accompany salvation. But he is speaking as if there were no evidence that they had genuinely been saved. He will take no risks. A whole generation of their ancestors had professed to believe Moses and God, but in the end it became apparent that they had never believed the gospel. So he holds up their experience to warn his readers against not ungodliness or worldliness, no, against something more serious than that, unbelief. You see, if you have never believed the gospel, you are an unbeliever, whatever spiritual experience you may have subsequently had. Therefore we shall find, as we read this letter, that the one great cardinal point that is stressed time and time again is the all-importance of faith. My righteous one will live by faith, declares chapter 10 verse 38, and chapter 11 follows with a whole 40 verses on the utterly indispensable requirement of faith. This, then, is the question this letter will confront us with. Are we genuine believers? Do we really believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And are we behaving in everyday affairs and especially in religious contexts in a way that is straightforwardly consistent with our professed belief, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, says Scripture, 1 John chapter 5 verse 1, and all who so believe will find tremendous encouragement in this letter to the Hebrews. It will remind them that God's word and God's oath give them a hope like an anchor for the soul, undrifting and firm. Every believer is secure. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 to 20. It will urge every believer to take courage and approach the throne of grace with confidence to find mercy for past mistakes and failures and grace for the future. Chapter 4, verse 16. Even if, like Peter, they have been inconsistent and have fallen and have temporarily denied the Lord who redeemed them, they have a high priest who prays for them as he prayed for Peter, that their faith shall not fail. Luke chapter 22 verse 32. And because he ever lives, he is able to save completely all who come to God through him. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. He will not lose one true believer. Indeed, everyone who rests only and altogether on the sacrifice of Christ is assured that by one sacrifice for sin, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Chapter 10 verse 14. So none of us need to be uncertain or insecure or debilitated by doubts about the completeness of our salvation through Christ. This very letter abounds with assurances that every believer, however weak, shall certainly be saved. But its powerful and insistent question will be, do you really believe? Not, have you made a profession of being a Christian, but are you a genuine believer? And so we shall be led to ask ourselves, is our behavior consistent with the gospel we profess to believe? 
is our faith for salvation in Christ alone or partly in him and partly in some ritual or sacrament? Is he our sole mediator with God or are we compromising our faith in him by relying on other mediators as well? Are we intellectually loyal to Christ or do we, while professing faith in him for salvation, allow ourselves to hold theories that, by implication, deny his divine authority in other areas? Are we allowing our background and culture to pressure us into continuing practices that are inconsistent with the gospel we profess to believe? Do we really believe that Jesus is the Messiah King and is coming again to reign? And are we taking up our cross and bearing his reproach or compromising with the world that crucified him? Does our pursuit of holiness make it clear that we are genuine believers in the true grace of God? Or are we trying to mix faith in Christ with a permissive lifestyle that changes the grace of God into a license for immorality? If we are genuine believers, Christ will save us completely. But then, if we do really believe, Others will be able to see evidence in our lives that we are believers, things that accompany salvation.